If you have a good old-fashioned hard copy of the Bible with you this morning, I invite you to make your way to Psalm 100. If you've got a device or something that you can get there, I uh, encourage you to find Psalm 100 as well. We're going to stand together as I read this this morning. As you're finding it and as you're standing, uh, we're in this Galatian series, and I'll be honest, I changed up my schedule some as I was looking ahead, and we had that Reformation Sunday, and, and so things got kind of flopped around, and so I had the opportunity this week, I was like, it's Thanksgiving week, let's look at Thanksgiving uh, in the scripture. So I'm excited about this as we look at this psalm this morning. So, Psalm 100, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and is faithfulness to all generations. You can have a seat. As I was preparing this week and kind of wrestling with the scripture, this idea that I came across really gave me pause and it was the difference between thankfulness and thanksgiving. And the more I thought about it, the bigger and the more profound it became. And what hit me was I I think in large part, we as people have kind of confused the distinction between the two. I mean, I don't know if maybe you, I've heard of this being a tradition in a lot of homes. We've done it before uh, at our home, but not something we do every year. But you might go around in this season of Thanksgiving and, and, and people share, what are you thankful for? And I think it's a great tradition, but I think the, what we've done is we've muddied the difference between being thankful and thanksgiving. And they are really two different things, maybe the best way to describe being thankful and uh, with its subtle differences, the closest synonym I could come up with was gratitude. Being thankful is, it's a feeling, it's an emotion of gratitude. Uh, it's like a, it's like being appreciative for something that we've either been given or we experience. I, I would say that I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for Crossings Community Church. I'm thankful that we gather into a place where it's so obvious that people love each other well. I'm thankful to come into a church body where we have people who are excited to serve. I'm thankful that we have individuals on the other side of the building this morning who are here serving and taking the gospel of Jesus Christ and giving it to the next generation, and we have that every single week. I'm thankful that we have small group leaders who are excited about creating environments and leading and serving in a way that sees homes transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for our body. I'm thankful for our church. But that's not thanksgiving. There's a difference. If we dive into the Hebrew word that we find in the psalm this morning, specifically in verse 4, we, we find this definition. It's, it's an offering of thanks often accompanied by sacrifice. An offering of thanks that's often accompanied by sacrifice. So Thanksgiving is active. Thanksgiving, it's, it's active. It's an intentional action. You hear in those, those, those definitive words that I just read, this, this idea of offering something that's active. It's doing something, offering of thanks, often accompanied by sacrifice. That's giving something. It's doing. It's intentional. It's active. So maybe in an incredibly oversimplified way we could say this morning that thankfulness is a feeling and thanksgiving is an active response to that feeling. Thankfulness is a feeling that we experience, but thanksgiving is an active response to those feelings. My son, who is our youngest, on his ninth birthday, what he wanted more than anything was a Lionel Messi jersey. And some of you in here may not have any idea who that is, and because uh, we're here, we're in the deep south, we're in uh, 
football country by some crazy reason. And then I love it. My son fell in love with soccer. And so that's his thing. That's every, uh, whether it was his birthday last year or Christmas coming up, everything that he's asking for revolves around soccer. And so for that last birthday, he wanted a messy jersey. And if you're not a soccer person, the uh, the best comparison that I can give you this morning, and this is something that could probably be argued for days, but I'll just go ahead and say it. He is the Michael Jordan of soccer. If you grew up in a day similar to me, you grew up watching Michael Jordan, who was just this artist on the court. And I remember growing up, I wanted the shoes. Every time the shoes were released, I wanted, the, I wanted to wear his shoes. And so Lionel Messi may be the greatest soccer player of all time, if you're in that world. Again, I could probably, after church today, if there are any soccer fans, they may come up to me and say, no, 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 it's Ronaldo, it's somebody else. But, but I, I really believe he is one of the greatest, and he's become one of my son's favorite. And so in wanting this jersey, I had to do some research, figure out how do I find it, how do I get it. There was one specific one that he wanted, a specific color that he wanted. And so I found it, and I ordered it, and we got it in. And so it's his birthday, and he's opening up his presents, and he opens it and he sees, he sees that it's that exact jersey, the colorway that he wanted with Messi's name on the back, number 10 on the jersey. And the look on his face is, is thankfulness at times 100. And, and, and his response was, he looked at it and he saw what it was and, and there was something in him where he had to do something. He got up and, and, and it was it was. It took thank you longer to come out of his mouth than it did for him to travel the path to get to his mom and I to give us a hug. That's how quickly he was erupting in thanksgiving. It was he looked at it and he saw it and he was so excited. He was running over to us saying thank you as he threw his arms around us. It was uncontrollable in him. We could just see it. It was so fun to watch. I was asking my wife this week if we had the video and we couldn't find it. I was going to show you the video just just to be able to see this excitement, uncontrollable, involuntary action that's birthed out of a sense of thankfulness. That's thanksgiving. That's what the scripture is talking about when it says thanksgiving, an active, intentional response. It's an offering, even for my newly turned nine-year-old. An offering, a response, there had to be something his body needed to do because of the feelings or the emotion that was inside him. And so that's the way the psalmist is describing here, thanksgiving. That's the instruction that he's given to us as those who are in the presence of God. I like the way one translation has verse 1. It says, let the whole earth shout triumphantly to God. Eugene Peterson's paraphrase says it this way, which I love for other reasons that I'll tell you. It says, on your feet now, applaud God, for verse 1 of Psalm 100. I love that because in verse 1, when you look at the language that the psalmist uses, it's an imperative command. It is a command, and it is forceful. It's a forceful, on your feet now, applaud God. The psalmist is going to work his way to the explanation as to the why or how question, but don't miss that opening of the forcefulness of get on your feet, do something in response to God. He leaves no room for passivity. There's no room for passivity. There's no room for, for, the, for complacency. It doesn't matter personality. It doesn't matter circumstance. What matters here is who God is. You see, so many times when we talk about thankfulness or thanksgiving or response to God, I hear this language or this undertone of, well, this is how I feel or I don't feel like it or this is my personality or this is what I'm going through or what I'm distracted by. When you hear that, you hear this common thread woven through every single comment of this is me and my and me and my and what's going on with me. What the psalmist is directing our attention to is who God is. We erupt in thanksgiving and praise because of who God is, not because of who we are or how we feel or what our personalities are like. And it's not that one-dimensional. When you continue reading, and you see in verse 2, the active response continues, right? Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Two more imperative commands. There are a total of five in those 
this short psalm that we read, Psalm 100, five imperative commands. And if you, like me, um, weren't necessarily the best student in high school English grammar, uh, I'll remind you what that means. I didn't learn grammar until I was in graduate school and learning other languages. I couldn't stand it when I was learning English. I needed it to learn other languages. And so the imperative, that idea is, it is a, it's a command that's given with force. It's a command. You're being told to do something more than you're being asked to do something. It's forceful. There's five of those, and we just see the second, serve the Lord. So first, it's shout. And then what's interesting is we don't see a depiction or a command that could be read or construed as respond to a God, respond to God in a way that feels comfortable to you. That would be the opposite of an imperative here. Respond, people of God, in a way that feels comfortable to you based on how you feel this morning. That's not what the psalmist says. These imperatives are powerful, they're forceful, and they're rooted in the reality of who God is, not who we are or what we are feeling in any given moment, but rather they're rooted in the thankfulness that threads over every circumstance when we begin to understand who God is. We're seeing examples here of thanksgiving, this active response that flows out of the emotion of thankfulness. Let's be honest, the people around us here in this Katy Richmond area, I mean, honestly, you could probably say America, but looking at the local church, they largely understand um, in our community the church to be a place where they come and they receive, right? It's a consumer mentality we often talk about. It's the idea that within our community, There are people, when they gather to church, whether they call themselves Christians or not, they gather to a church and their goal is, I want to receive something. I need encouragement for my week. I hope the pastor gives me something to encourage me to go throughout my week. I need sometimes a break from my children. I hope for at least an hour they take my children away from me for a bit and keep them safe. Others, even mature Christians, would say, no, I like to learn interesting facts about the Bible. I want to learn more about this wonderful book, so I hope the pastor gives me some more new knowledge about the Bible. And that mature Christian might say, I hope that they take my children and teach them about Jesus. Well, those are all good things. The latter are good things. Those are good hopes. Those should be our desires, but they should not be what drives us into the presence of God. Those should, be, those should be things that we're blessed by, but what drives us into the presence of God, what drives us into the gathering place of his people should be a thankfulness based on who he is that erupts in us of thanksgiving. And that response then is our worship, whether that's serving on the other end of the building or greeting or setting up or sitting in the seats here today and throwing our arms in the air in response to who our God is. That is, is what should drive us. The others are bonuses, bonuses that we love about being a part of the bride of Christ. In verse three, where the psalmist turns, turns next, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, we are his, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. I think the psalmist anticipates the how question. He anticipates the reader who would say, as they're looking at this psalm, maybe, or as you're in here this morning hearing this sermon, and you'd say something like, well, if I'm honest, my thankfulness does not erupt into thanksgiving. My response just stops at gratitude. And if we're honest, there are some of you in here, I would dare not ask you to raise your hand, but there are definitely people in here this morning who would say just that. If I'm honest, then then I feel thankful, I feel thankful, but that thankfulness doesn't erupt in me into thanksgiving. It's not an active response, it's not intentional. I don't feel the thanksgiving that I see here. And then the assumption by the psalmist is simply this, then you must not know God. You must not know God. If your thankfulness doesn't erupt in thanksgiving, then you don't know this God. You don't know that every good and perfect gift, according to James, comes from above, coming down from the Father of lights. The psalmist says, know that Yahweh, he is God. 
His verbiage here is so beautiful because in the minds of the contemporary reader or even the first century reader of this psalm who would have had it memorized, he's using the word Yahweh. If you have an ESV translation, uh, one gift that they give to us is every time the word Yahweh is used in the Hebrew Old Testament, they will translate it with all capital letters in your Old Testament. So if you see that, all capital L-O-R-D, that is Yahweh there and not the other names such as Adonai for God. Know that Yahweh, he is God. So let's look back and ask the question, why then would the psalmist decide to use that word? What is he trying to call to mind for you and I today as well as his contemporary listeners as he's saying, then you must not know who this is. Let me read to you where this name was First revealed back in Exodus chapter 3, Moses says to God, this is Exodus chapter 3 verse 13, Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name, what shall I say to them? God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, there it is, it's Yahweh, all capitals in the English translation, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So in other words, what the psalmist is saying is he's saying you have forgotten that the I am is God. Not only do you, you must not know him if your thankfulness isn't erupting into thanksgiving, but, but you must not know that Yahweh, I am who I am, the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who provided Isaac miraculously, the one that took Jacob back into the promised land, reinstating the promise, the one who has carried the people of God throughout all times in his sovereignty fulfilling every promise, you must not realize he's the one that we're talking about. Yahweh, he he is God. I am the I am. It's a beautiful smashing together there in Exodus chapter three of, of when he says, this is my name. Tell him I am who I am. And he takes and you just take all of those Hebrew words and you cram them together like this and you have Yahweh. I am who I am. There is nothing outside of me. I am everything. I am the first mover. I am the sustainer. I am everything. You must have forgotten who our God is. Know that Yahweh, he is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. If our thankfulness is not erupting in thanksgiving, then we must not truly know our God. Think with me for a moment back to to maybe more of what he's saying here. As I read, when he says, not only he made us and we are his, we are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Remember this incredibly familiar passage also in Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. Know that Yahweh, he is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people and sheep of his pasture. This is the God that we're being called to worship. This is the God that the psalmist is saying, if you truly do know him, then your feeling of mere thankfulness will erupt in in uncontrollable thanksgiving. This is our God. Do you know him? That's the question that's being demanded upon us as we read this. Do you know him? Verse 4 
Enter his gates with thanksgiving. His courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Another one of those imperatives there. You must enter his presence with thanksgiving. You must enter. And that's like what the psalmist is kind of drawing everything towards. Here, you've got to know this. This is the way you need to respond so that when you, when you enter the presence of God, when you gather together, you're entering his courts with, with thanksgiving, not mere thankfulness, but thankfulness that, 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 that erupts in you with the active response of, of thanksgiving because he is good. His love wasn't momentary for you. He didn't just love you at the moment that he rescued you, but his love endures forever. The same goes for his faithfulness. The psalmist says it is without end. The psalmist wants us to know not only who he is, but what he's done for us. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Verse 5, for he's good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations When you have children, you experience a new angle of love. And the best way that I think I can describe it is this love that you have for a child is like this enormous canopy. If you can picture in your mind this enormous canopy, and under that canopy of love are moments of frustration, are moments of anger, are moments of disappointment amidst all of the moments of joy and laughter, right? But all of those moments, whether the highest high or the lowest of low, they all sit in the shadow of this great canopy of love. The term that we find in our Hebrew Old Testament for this love that's used here in Psalm 100, the love of God for his people, it's one of those words that uh, in the Hebrew language you have to spit a little bit to say. Chesed, that first H has that like clear your throat, cough, spit kind of vibe to it. Uh, But it's a word that's unique in the Hebrew Old Testament and used for the love of God for his people. And it's the word as you look at verse 5 that's that's amplified by two words, steadfast love. Chesed, steadfast love. If you continue to dive deep into it, you see other kinds of synonyms such as steadfast loving kindness, unfailing faithfulness. But something else that you find the deeper that you look at that word is a sense of obligation. Not an obligation that comes from some outside force, but an obligation that comes from within. It is as though the love of God is so steadfast and so constant that inside it, it swells within itself an an internal and an eternal obligation to itself to be unending. Constant love, unfailing Love, the love that God has for us is fierce, it's mighty, it's strong, and yet it's as sure as the ground we stand on. Faithfulness, steadfastness. His steadfast love for you, you as a child of the Most High God, is unending. His faithfulness to you, you in here who are children of God, you've come to that place in life where you've placed your faith in him, you realized you were never going to be good enough to receive the favor of God and so you look to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and you saw that bridge that he became taking on the, the price, paying that price for your sin as the substitute and you by placing your faith in him became free from the bondage of sin and walking in the hope of God's right righteousness given to you and if that's you today then God's love for you is unending it's a canopy that opens up above your head that is bigger more enormous than any circumstance of your life it's bigger than the culmination of all the circumstances of your life his faithfulness over you stretches larger than every moment of job loss or health issue or struggle (coughs) He is bigger than all of those. His love endures forever. His faithfulness, they endure forever. (coughs) I remember early in the stages of Lori and I's dating relationship, 
The way we communicated, I shared with you a couple weeks ago about our dot matrix printed uh, emails that I sent to her, long love letters essentially that unfortunately she still possesses. But I remember the phone calls, we would spend hours and hours on the phone, uh, long distance bills back when that was a reality, uh, racking up huge long distance bills. And there was this, this desire to know everything about each other. Maybe some of you remember that in your dating journey. We just wanted to, I wanted to know all of her. What are her favorite foods? What are her favorite movies? What are all those childhood memories that maybe seem insignificant, but they're seared into her mind for some reason? What are her dreams? What does she desire? What does she daydream about? I wanted to know everything. And there was sort of this unspoken and impending pressure that I needed to know it all now. You needed to. We spent hours and hours talking, trying to learn things about each other. And I would tell you that probably as we uh, approached our wedding day and got married, I felt like I knew her completely. I could tell you the, I could tell you the, the favorite movies and the foods and stories uh, about our life. I knew, I knew so much. But I look back today, I say, well, I really didn't know her at all. I mean, the past 20 years that we'll celebrate here in just a month, 20 years of marriage, I, I know her today so completely different than I did that day, and I may not know any new facts about her, but I know her today because we've journeyed through life in proximity with one another through the various circumstances of life, overcoming various situations of life, and that's how we truly got to know each other. Knowing facts about each other creates no intimacy really at all, but rather the, the journey of doing life together as we see circumstances, difficult circumstances, and doing those and approaching those together, navigating those t- together creates a, an intimacy where you really do know each other. You can tell each other how you're going to respond to various circumstances because you've been through those circumstances together. You know what each other is thinking sometimes, and you don't have to say it because you've heard it so many times. I fear that many of us in here have confused that distinction of knowing about God and knowing him. That we've come to a place where we know a lot about God. We know a lot about this book. We're really smart people, and it's, it's a great thing to know a lot about this book. But we've equated that with knowing God. I'll never forget the feeling that I had one time in seminary when we had this book we had to read. It was on textual criticism, which would bore half of you to death, uh, 90% of you to death. And uh, we're reading this book, and, and it, was, uh, it, was, it was interesting. I was learning things about the Bible. And, and so I Googled the author of this book. And the author was a non-believing professor at UNC. He had written that the book on textual criticism here and yet did not have a relationship with Jesus. I was like, he knew more about the New Testament than I would never know in my entire lifetime. And yet he did not have a relationship with Jesus. It was the ultimate definition of knowing so much about a God and yet not knowing him at all. God, how heartbreaking would it be for us to be so confused that we journey through life thinking that knowing God equates to how many times I show up at church. Knowing God equates to how many different tidbits or nuggets of knowledge that I know about this book and then think somehow that that means I have a relationship with him. That's just not the case. A relationship with our God to know God is journeying in proximity with him through life as we interact with his word in prayer, journeying through circumstances of our life where he carries us through those and then we get to know him. We know him deeply because we're spending time with him. We're not just knowing about him. We're really creating and sustaining a relationship with him where he carries us through life. That's what it means to know God. Again, do you know him? To know him is to spend time with him and to journey in proximity with him. And as we truly know God, our thankfulness erupts into thanksgiving. Our thankfulness erupts into thanksgiving. Let me read this to you one more time. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know 
that Yahweh, he is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. The invitation to us today is to know him. And if we know him, when we enter his presence, the thankfulness will erupt in thanksgiving. And so again, I ask you the question, do you know him? Or are you journeying through life accumulating facts, knowing a lot about him, but having nothing that looks like a relationship? And as some crazy pastor stands up before you today talking about how we should respond to this God, you're saying, I don't have it, I don't feel it, that's not me. Well, then I would just reiterate what the psalmist says. You must not know our God. I invite you to bow your head and close your eyes and I just want, I just want in the, in the quietness of this room, just encourage you to take a deep breath and ask yourself that question. Do I know him? Do I know him? It may feel uncomfortable for you, but I want to give you just a minute to set on that question before we continue in response. Ask yourself, wrestle with that idea. Do I know him? If you hear that question and you're here this morning and you've never come to a place where you've placed your faith in Jesus, then I'd invite you to do that this morning. There's not magic moments or times or things to wait on or things to prepare in your own life. This is faith, believing in who he is and what he accomplished and his rescue of you by his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead out of pursuit and love for you. If you've got questions about that, then I encourage you to come, whether myself up here on the front row or other prayer leaders that are on the front row, and grab somebody and ask and pray. We would love to tell you what it means to experience the joy of being in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Others of you in here this morning who you have come to that place, you've begun a relationship with him, but you're still wrestling with that question. Do I really know him? I know a lot about him, but do I really know him? I encourage you this morning to just respond to, just respond to the reality that he rescued you. If that's all you know for sure this morning is that he saved you out of death and into life. He saved you out of hopelessness and into hope. If you know this morning that he's your redeemer and you know that as you leave here this morning, you need to begin journeying through life with him, but you can stand firm and say, yes, he is my rescuer. Yes, he is my redeemer. Then my invitation to you is the same as the psalmist is to all of us and that is to respond in thanksgiving this morning. That our worship today would not be mere thankfulness, but our worship would be an active response to who our God is. Father, we love you and we are humbled. We are humbled by the fact that you love us the way that you do, that in spite of our sinfulness, in spite of who we are, Father, that you love us anyway because of the way that you sent your son to die for us. And so you've given us righteousness, righteousness that we do not deserve. You've rescued us out of places of complete despair and death. 
and you'd rescued us into life and hope. And so, Father, this morning, Father, we, we say thank you. We say thank you in worship, not just, not just in the way that we feel, but, Father, we say thank you in our worship, in the way that we serve, in the way that we exist in your presence this morning. God, help us to understand what it means to be in your courts with thanksgiving. We love you. We need you. We worship you. In the spirit of worship and prayer this morning, I encourage you to stand up. If you're physically able, then maybe your active response can be active enough to be on your feet this morning in response to who our God is. Let us worship.